Okay, recording is on. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC214, our course on developing the human spirit. Um, let's take a moment just to pray together and get started. So the others will also, sorry, join the class soon. Could somebody lead us in prayer, please? And then we will start. Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we humble ourselves before your presence. We pray, O oh God, as we learn from your word, you would speak to us and help us to know more about de developing our spirits in you, O oh God. We pray that you would speak to our hearts and establish us in your kingdom. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Once again, Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, I know we had a break last week. Sorry, I couldn't take my class last week. Um, so let's quickly review what we did the week before in the very first lecture, and then we will take things forward from there. I'm going to just share the uh, lecture one notes uh, so that we could uh, all, all see it and follow along. So. We started uh, in section one, we started talking about just trying to understand some things that we see revealed to us in scripture about the human spirit. Now, we began by saying that we are tripart beings, spirit, soul, and body. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 23. The scriptures tell us, you know, that we are spirit, soul, and body. So we understand the body is the outer man, the outer part of us. The soul is our mind, our intellect, our ability to reason, and so on. And our spirit is the eternal part of us. It's the part of us that can contact the spiritual realm, uh, that can contact God, and we must understand that the human spirit is the real person. The human spirit is the real person. Because even after the body and the faculties of the mind physically die, that is when a person dies and the body, everything decays, the spirit continues to live. And that's the real part of us, continues to exist. Right? So we said the human spirit is a real person. Then we started looking at other scriptures. We looked at Hebrews 4 verse 12, where we saw that the spirit and the soul are distinct because the word of God pierces, penetrates, to the dividing asunder of spirit and soul. So the spirit and soul must not be confused. Uh, they are very closely intertwined, but they are also very distinct. They're different parts of us. So spirit and soul. And then we saw that it is the word of God that helps us understand the difference. What is from the soul? What is from the spirit? Because the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the word of God will tell us clearly, help us understand clearly what is coming from the heart, what is from the soul, which is our emotions and our mind and so on and so forth. Then we spent quite some time on first Peter chapter three verse four, where you know the the uh, in first Peter three four, of course the context is about uh, the outward adorning and the dressing and all that. But in that context, Peter says that, referring to the heart, the spirit, he says, the hidden person of the heart. You know, So the real person is the hidden person. It's the heart. The heart, the spirit is a real person. And, and, and then he talks about the beauty of the hidden person, which is in the sight of God of great price. You know, and he talks about characteristics, a quiet and a gentle spirit. Right? So these are things to keep in mind that the human spirit, the heart, has its own character or characteristics. In First Peter 3, 
uh, he's specifically talking about uh, a, a quiet and a gentle spirit. So uh, it, it's, those are the characteristics that he's mentioning there. And like that, there can be so many other characteristics of love and joy and peace. And these are things that come from the spirit. Right? And he says, in the sight of God, it's of great value. You know, so uh, God looks at our spirit. Uh, he sees the character of our spirit, and he said, "That's that's very precious. That's what is very precious to God, and that's what He's after. You know, He's 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 after that, because the body you know, will you know will grow old and die, but the spirit is going to live, and that's eternal. Um, so the beauty of the outward man is fading, but the beauty of the inner man is eternal. It's going to last forever." And so we emphasize that from First Peter chapter three and verse four. So uh, these are some of the notes that we um, discovered. Now, uh, some things in relation to uh, the spirit and soul um, in the New Testament, you, we will find the phrase "inner man" quite often, and when, especially in the writings of the Apostle Paul, he uses this quite a lot. And uh, when he refers to the inner man or the inward man, uh, it's it's talking about the inner person made up of spirit and soul together. You know that means there is a part of our soul that because it overlaps and intertwines with the spirit so closely. You know he's talking about this inner person. So when we say inner person, we are referring to the spirit and soul together. Or inner man, uh, inward man, who you are on the inside, spirit and soul together. So we use that, or the New Testament uses inner man like that. Now, what happens at death? And this is these are the side notes, just <laughs> to keep us uh, to give us a little understanding. It's not as, as a side note. What happens during death? At death, the body is separated from the inner man which is the spirit and soul. So the body, which is our flesh and blood and bones, uh, that goes into the ground, it decays, it disintegrates, becomes dust. But the inner person, which is the spirit and the soul, will continue, either in heaven or in hell. So that means, this inner person that continues is conscious, you know. Uh, so that's why, uh, for example, when we see, when we read about uh, in Luke 16, we read about this rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. Uh, this rich man went into hell and he was in torment. And he cried out, he said, you know, can he just dip? The tip of his finger in water and come and touch my tongue, you know. So uh, that so that means he is very conscious. He's feeling these things, and uh, which you know that this consciousness or this being aware of things is part of our soul, and and, and so he remembers those things, and um, he even says, you know, Lord. You know, uh, can, and I mean, I'm sorry. He he says, you know, can somebody go and warn my brothers? You know, see, that means he has recollection of those things. So there is that consciousness that we that that seems to be there even after death. You know, so that's the inner person, spirit, and soul. Now let's pick up from there and share a few more things now about the spirit. In John chapter 4, verses 21 to 24, and this is uh, uh, a familiar passage for us, uh, what we want to emphasize from John 4, 21 to 24, is that our primary engagement with God is in the Spirit. Our primary interactions with Him is Spirit to Spirit. So John chapter 4, verses 21 to 24, uh, uh, let's uh, could somebody read that for us, John chapter 4, 21 to 24, please. So.
John chapter 4 verse 21 to 24 Jesus declared believe me women a time is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you Samaritans worship what you do not know we worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for they are the kind of worshiper the father seeks God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth Mm. Thank you. So, uh, we, we, we are familiar with these scriptures. Um, what I want to point out is, you know, this woman, Samaritan woman, is talk, trying to discuss with Jesus about the location, you know, which place I go, which mountain must I go to, you know, to worship God. And Jesus' response is, he's focusing on this whole spirit spiritual dynamic that means God is spirit so it's not about which mountain you're going to go it's not about the place from where but it is our spirit that is going to worship God and that's why he's saying look basically if you want to paraphrase it you can worship God from wherever because it is your spirit it's going to worship God. God is spirit, and you worship Him in spirit and in truth. That means it's a spiritual thing, and it is being done in truth or in sincerity, you know, that you're really sincere about it. That's what God is looking for. You worship Him in spirit and worship Him in truth. So our primary engagement with God is spiritual. Now, this does not mean that God won't touch our soul and our body. Of course, He is God over our whole being. So He can touch our soul, He can touch our emotions, we can feel, we can feel joy, we can feel, uh, you know, all those things, uh, emotions. And uh, we sometimes physically also, God will touch us. All that is there. But our primary interaction is spirit to spirit. God is spirit. And as we interact with Him, we worship Him in spirit and truth. Another scripture that we want to look at is Philippians 3 and verse 3. Uh, it's, it's, it's similar to what we just read, but it's also good to look at it. Philippians 3, 3, where Paul himself states the same thing. Somebody could read that for us. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3, please. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Amen. Thank you. So similar to what we just read in John 4, Paul is saying we worship God in the spirit. Same thing, right? We worship God, we engage with God spiritually, to spirit, to spirit. We worship God in the spirit. And we are not putting any confidence in the flesh. That means in our engagement with God, it is not based on what I'm doing in the flesh. You know, It is my spirit that is going to engage with God. And therefore, in my spirit, you know, God is also going to interact with me. God is going to engage with me. What is interesting is not only does God, uh, Paul present this in in our worship of God, he also says that in our service to God, it is out of our spirit. So it is interesting. Let's go to Romans chapter 1, verse 9. Romans 1, 9. And uh, somebody could read that for us. We just quickly look at that. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit, in the gospel of his son. Amen. So Paul is saying, we serve God. I serve with my spirit. Romans chapter 1 and verse 9. So I was serving God. That means our ministry is also coming out of our spirit. And so, you know, I... Last time in the class, we just said, you know, of course, 
uh, when we're doing ministry, uh, we look, we think about the natural, you know, uh, what what kind of clothes we're going to wear and how we are going to, uh, you know, uh, appear in front of people. Okay, fine, that has its place. We, we of course have to, uh, you know, look clean and decent and all of those things. But the work of the ministry is actually going to take place out of our spirit. Right? So Paul says. I serve God in my spirit or with my spirit. You know? So Christian ministry then comes out of our spirit. It is not the strength of our intellect. It is not the strength of our physical body. Although, of course, we have to use our body and we are using our mind, of course. Uh, that's part of how we in engage with the world. But it is really out of our spirit. That we serve God, right? So, both in our worship to God and in our service to God, it is coming from our spirit, from our spirit, and that's why the spirit, the human spirit, is so important. And that's what we're going to talk about as we move along. How do we develop our human spirit? in our worship of God and in our service to God so that we can do this better, right? We can worship Him better, we can serve Him well, because it is a work of the Spirit. So we covered till this last class. Now, some additional thoughts concerning the Spirit, the human Spirit. What we seem to understand from the scriptures, and you know, uh, uh, there are only a few verses on this, so uh, I don't want to make it like a big doctrine or something. But I just want to say what we can see in the scriptures is that the human spirit has a starting point, a beginning, like just as we are born physically. There is a time, there is a moment in time when God creates us. And when God creates us, He creates a spirit, soul, and body. So there's a moment in time. So, example, if somebody asks me my date of birth, okay, I've said now I'm 11th this year. <laughs> I was born. Okay, that means that was my physical birth. That is the time physically I came into this world. But some time, which approximately nine months before that, some moment in time, God created me as a person, spirit, soul, and body, somewhere. And it happened in my mother's womb. That's where we all begin, right? So while the physical process started, and we don't know exactly when, we don't know exactly how, but Almighty God is the one who creates the human spirit. So He created the human spirit. See, man cannot create the human spirit. God created. So some moment in time, God created. And what we can see in scripture is that just as there is a physical growth of the body, the, the, the organs, the human spirit can also grow in it is fact. And we feel it from the human spirit has faculties, just like the physical body has faculties. And we will identify those faculties. And these faculties can be developed. In the human spirit. So if you look at Hebrews 12, let us read those two verses, please. Um, and in Hebrews chapter 12, and we will look at verse 9, and we'll also look at verse 23. Somebody could read these two scriptures for us. Hebrews 9, uh, Hebrews 12, 9 and 23. Hebrews 9, Hebrews 12, 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits, and live? Verse 23. 
to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Mm. Okay, thank you. Now, the reason we picked out these two verses is because both these verses are talking of something, saying, telling us something about the spirit. In verse 9, Hebrews 12, 9, the writer of Hebrews is calling God as the father of spirits. So, he is the father, the one who creates or who gives life, gives birth to every human spirit. So, he's the father of spirits. Every, all of us, every human being, every human spirit starts there because God created he's the father but very interestingly then in verse 23 he's saying he's talking again about the spirits but he's saying the spirits of just men made perfect so of course he's talking about people who have come to know God who are being born again and they're part of the church and so he's talking about believers here so he's talking about the spirits of just men or just people, people who have been justified. Made perfect, made mature. No? So that word perfect is being brought to maturity. So he's saying, uh, it's about believers, he's saying, the spirits of these people, just people, that have been made mature or grown up, so, interestingly, and we will of course see other passages, that the human spirit is, has been made, or it, is, it has gone through this growing process by which it has come to a place of maturity. Spirits of just men made perfect, brought to maturity. So, our human spirit has a beginning. God is the Father, Creator. And we are saying the human spirit is also being made mature, being made perfect. It's growing, you know. And there will be other scriptures that we can see. Now, as part of this, what is interesting, it, the Bible seems to indicate, uh, and you know, it's generally referred to as a stage of innocence. A stage of innocence. Now, why is this important and why are we making mention of it is because uh, I, we cannot, you know, we cannot say this, so I don't want to argue, I don't want to fight about this. I'm just, you know, sharing this as, okay, this is something that seems to be there in Scripture, but, you know, we don't want, we can't say everything for sure. But it seems like that for the human spirit, when it is born, it is born innocent. It is not born. Uh, so there's a stage of innocence, and then after after that, there is a place where God holds the person responsible for sin. Now we know, and we will look at all these scriptures. We know that uh, you know uh, from the time Adam sinned, there is sin in this world. And by default, there is a propensity to go and sin. You know that. But it seems like there is a time period when God, by default, holds the person innocent. And after that, it says, now you're responsible. Now, how can we say that? Let us look at all these scriptures together. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. So I don't want to present this as, you know, okay, uh, this is the only way it is. No, I'm presenting it more as, here are a few scriptures. And again, there are not many. Uh, the, here are a couple of scriptures that seem to indicate it. So just to keep it in mind, uh, maybe it will help us understand things. But uh, even if we don't know this fully well, it's okay. No, we'll get to understand it in heaven. But let's look at this. In Romans chapter 7, 
verses 7 to 10. Somebody could uh, read this, please. Romans 7, 7 to 10. Romans chapter 7, verses 7 to 10. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, brought me in, brought in me all manner of evil desire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, evil desire. For, for without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Thank you. Okay, so Paul, of course, in Romans, when he's talking about his life under the law, and uh, how he struggled with sin, where uh, the Lord told him, you know, okay, this is the right thing to do. And uh, he wanted to do it, but he didn't have the power to do it. So that's Romans chapter 7. But while he's describing that, he says in verse 9, Romans 7, 9, he says, I was alive once, without the law but when the commandment came sin came alive or sin revived sin came alive and i died so this is one scripture and like i said you know we don't have too many scriptures on this but this is one scripture where people um, when i say people I have bible scholars uh, those who interpret scripture Bible teachers think that this seems to indicate a stage of innocence. So while we we know that, you know, in Psalm fifty one verse five, Paul, uh, Psalmist says, "In sin, my mother conceived me." So I was. It's like he's saying, "I was born like this. I was born in sin." And Romans five twelve says, "You know, sin passed upon every person." So, while we do understand that the fall is upon every person, the human race, and by default we are born in under sin, yet it seems to indicate Romans seven nine that there is a stage of innocence where he, Paul says, "I was alive without the law." What does it mean, I was alive without the law? So you think about Paul. He was born a Jew. That means he was born under the law. He was born a Jew. They, they already had the law. But he still says, I was alive without the law. Meaning, without the knowledge of the law. So the law was there. It was given to all the Jewish people. But till he didn't understand the law, he says, I was alive. But when the commandment came, verse 9, that means when I understood the commandment, then I died. That means now I was held responsible for my choices and my actions. And of course, I, I did the wrong thing. So sin brings death. So I died. So it seemed like there's this stage of innocence and again i don't want to present this like as a ultimate doctrine i'm just saying it seems like that uh, uh, you know there's a stage of innocence when the person is not very aware of uh, you know the law the commandment and uh, so until then okay yeah you're born under sin but god doesn't hold you responsible but once you understand the law, then God holds you responsible. Right? So, figs and a wise of what relevance would this be? Because some people ask, okay, when a baby dies, does the baby go to heaven or does the baby go to hell? Then we'd say, you know, yes, it is true that we are all born under sin. 
because Adam sinned and we're all born under sin. But can the baby be held responsible when it has no knowledge? You know, it hasn't, uh, people say, the age of accountability it hasn't come to that place where it understood the law. Can God, you know, send that child to hell? And so that's where we take to Romans 9. We say, okay, there seems to be this stage uh, where God doesn't hold, even though the human is default born under sin, it doesn't hold that spirit responsible until the understanding comes of the commandment. So, you know, so based on that, we say maybe, you know, uh, until that age of in, a, uh, in that stage of innocence or until that age of accountability, um, the baby who dies will go straight to heaven. And so that's that's kind of how we say it. Uh, but again, you know, I don't want to, because there's not too much in the scriptures, we can't, uh, you know, say this with clarity, but there seems to be. And I just wanted to share that. Right? But what we do know is, I'm going to the next point, is that because of sin, the human spirit starts off in that place of sin. Because by one man sin came into this world, death passed upon everybody, death passed on the human race. So we are born that, you know, we start off like that. So we see this in, uh, let's go to Ephesians 2. So let us understand the condition of the human spirit uh, under sin. All right? This is the way we all start off spiritually. Being born into this world. Ephesians chapter 2, um, verses, we can read, I guess we can read this 1 and 2. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2, somebody could read that. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. As for you, you were dead in your transition, transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the way of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Mm -hmm. So, Paul is telling us, you know, God made us alive, but what was our, 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 our condition before God made us alive? We were dead in sins. And we also walked according to the prince of the power of the air, it's referring to Satan. The spirit that works in those who are disobedient. So before we were born again, before God made us alive, spiritually we were dead. Now, that, that doesn't mean our spirit was didn't exist, our spirit existed. But a spirit did not have life from God. And instead, he says in verse 2, the spirit of disobedience was, or rebellion was working in our spirit. Yeah? So that's, well, that was our spiritual condition, or the condition of our human spirit, before we were born again. No, we were, we did we were dead, and Satan was actually working in us. We go to chapter four, Ephesians four. Uh, Paul explains that further, and uh, uh, we can just look at verse eighteen, Ephesians four eighteen. Some could read that, Ephesians four eighteen. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Mm, thank you. So again, here he's talking about the condition of the unsaved person. So Ephesians 2, 1, 2 and 3 and Ephesians 4, 17, 18. He's talking about the condition of the human spirit before being saved, before being born again. Here he's saying, in verse 18, our understanding was darkened. We couldn't understand spiritual things. We were cut off from the life of God. So we didn't have the life of God. 
So that's what it means, that is spiritual death. It means we do, don't have the life of God in our spirit. So it says they were cut off from the life of God. And their hearts was blinded, they were ignorant, heart was blind. So this is the condition of our spirit, or for every human person, before born again. They, we are spirit, soul and body, but our spirit is dead, is blinded, doesn't have spiritual understanding. Dead means, it doesn't mean it's not there, it is there, but doesn't have the life of God. Doesn't have God's life. Instead, the devil is working, he's, the spirit of disobedience and rebellion is working through our spirit, moving us to do all the evil things. Our hearts are hardened and blinded. We can't understand spiritual things. It's like we are, like so the Bible says we are in darkness. So there's darkness over our human spirit. But that is where this born again experience comes. Right? So when we are born again, and I'll just quickly summarize it because we, we know this. That when we are born again, what happens to our human spirit? God gives his life. The life of God comes into our spirit. The very life and the nature of God comes in. And the spirit of disobedience that was at work is banished. No longer. You cannot work in this person's spirit anymore. Because this spirit is now surrendered to Jesus Christ. So, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in our spirit. So before that, there was a spirit of rebellion working in our human spirit. Now, God the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in our human spirit. That's what the Bible says, yet the temple of the Holy Spirit. Christ dwells in your hearts. And we are born again. God gives us His own life and nature in our spirit. And our eyes are opened. We begin to understand spiritual things. We have come into the light. We are no longer in darkness. So this has happened to our human spirit when we got born again. So that's why we have become new creation in our spirit. You know, God is it's 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 dramatically changed now. From where we were, he says, You were dead, spirit of disobedience was working, you did not have the life of God, your spiritual understanding was darkened, your heart was hardened. Now we've come to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in us. Christ is dwelling in us. We have the life of God. Our heart is opened to God. Our eyes are open to understand spiritual things. We are in the light. So we are born again. But what I want to emphasize now is this human spirit, this born again human spirit, can grow. And uh, spiritually can grow and uh, some of the scriptures that we are familiar with first Peter 2 and verse 2 he says grow of uh, as newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby so he's 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 talking about the human spirit obviously he's not talking about the physical body because he's writing to grown people <laughs> So to the grown people, he's saying, like newborn babies, you desire the milk of the word. So obviously, he's not talking about our natural physical growth. He's talking about a spiritual growth. And he's saying, desire the milk of the word so you can grow by it. So that growth has to do with the growth of the born again human spirit. You can grow there. Or in 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, he says, Grow in grace and in the knowledge 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge. No, again, spiritual growth. Growth of the human, born again human spirit. The human spirit, the born again human spirit can grow. That means it can mature, it can increase in grace, talking about character and virtue. And it also grow in knowledge, meaning the understanding, the learning, the revelation. Spiritually, we can increase, we can grow. So, uh, so we mentioned, and there are several other scriptures here. We can see where we can increase in Revelation, in Ephesians one eighteen, Colossians three ten, talked about increasing in Revelation. We can know the will of God. That means the human spirit begins to understand the will of God. This is what God is pleased. This is what God wants for me. So the human spirit begins to understand that. The human spirit can also become strong. You know, uh, we can grow in strength. Ephesians 3.16 you know, We strengthen with strength by his spirit in the inner that means the spirit can become stronger, it can acquire strength. So just given this, we will talk in depth about the faculties, uh, developing the faculties of the human spirit. But I just mentioned this here saying that, look, we are born again, but this born again spirit needs to be developed. It needs to grow. It's a to grow in grace, it needs to grow in strength. It needs to grow in no, the will of God and other areas of development. Okay, so let me just pause here and see if uh, there are any questions. Uh, is everybody with me so far? Any questions here? All right, I see a question, John. Um, it says, uh, this be applicable to people who are mentally challenged. So, yeah, so, you know, uh, that's also a question we can ask, right? Uh, you know, well, what about those who are born, you know, mentally challenged? They don't have the ability to understand things, you know. Uh, so, we don't have clear challenges. Can go back to you what we understood from one seven, but because we don't understand the content, uh, they may be alive to God. He says, "I have alive to the commandment." You know, there's that statement. Most likely, again, I'm saying most likely because looking here. Words, um, that that's the way God would probably, you know, uh, deal with them, uh, not holding them for their sins against them, you know. And uh, so that's that's how we would think that, that God would deal with them. God to decide on this, yeah. Any question so far? What we've covered. Right. So what we've said, we've tried to see to make see the journey how the spirit was before being born again, and now that you're born again, uh, we've got the life of God. But that doesn't mean this this spirit is in its full full state. Right. We see in Scripture that that born again human spirit has to be developed. It has to grow, and that is the objective of this course: how to develop. The born again human spirit, that means the spirit that has come to life in Christ, how to develop that. Because the Bible tells us to grow in grace, to grow in the knowledge, to grow in strength, uh, to grow in knowing the will of God. So, how do we grow the human spirit to you know to become all this? And eventually, we the Bible has called us, God calls us to grow to the fullness of Christ, to be 
like Christ. So how do we make this journey? That's the part of this, uh, what we're going to cover in this course. Okay, so I think I will pause here today. There's a little note about uh, the soul and uh, what will happen when somebody dies. I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly review this uh, or mention about this in the next class. And then we will kind of dive into, you know, okay, what are the faculties we will identify? What are the faculties of the human spirit as we see in scripture? And how do we develop each of those faculties? Of course, everything based on the scriptures, based on what the Bible teaches, right? So we're not, we're not talking anything outside of the Bible, everything from the scriptures. But I hope this journey is clear. We are born again. We are new creation in Christ, but the spirit has to develop. It has to be made mature. It has to grow. And that's what we want to understand, how to grow it according to the scriptures. So let's stop here for today. Um, and any questions, please feel free to ask. All right? Let's pray together, and then we will wrap up our class. Anybody wants to pray, please pray. Father, we want to thank you for the life of our pastor, for the life of our students, for the life of our college. We want to thank you for bringing us together. We want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to listen to your word. We want to ask that you continue to bless our pastor so that we will impact a greater knowledge in us. We also ask that you make us receptive, make us, give us a receptive heart and a receptive mind so that we can intake all what they are impacting on us and we'll continue to go on out and become the salt and the light for this community that we serve. We want to thank you for everything. We want to thank you and we want to continue to bless your name. Let your name be blessed. Let your name be glorified from everlasting to everlasting. This and every other message we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll see you again uh, soon. God bless. Bye now. Thank you.